Welcome, uh, uh, everyone, uh, to this particular session, a very special session with Flybys and Forcepoint. Uh, we're going to be looking at a, a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer panel session with some insights from Alex Lazau, who is the Head of Security or the Chief Information Security Officer with Flybys. Alex, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And also Nick Savides, uh, the Senior Director of Strategic Business with Forcepoint, and this is in partnership with Forcepoint. So, Nick, uh, great to have you with us again. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good to see you again, Alex. Very good. And Alex is, will be the sort of the centre of this particular session, uh, and it's really a, a takeaway learning session for anyone involved in security transformation projects uh, or who even uh, is considering a security transformation project. So it really is we'll be looking at the data protection considerations during a security transformation project. And the key focus that we've got is those common data protection challenges uh, organizations are facing during uh, these transformation projects. We're going to get particular insights into the flybys experience uh, and also what uh, flybys considered as part of their tr uh, security transformation project. And also things like security terminology, team changes and team structure, uh, and also very important is their, their culture that they were establishing as well. And some of the key advice and takeaways for those planning or about to execute uh, a security transformation project. What we really like, uh, there's again, people coming in now, but uh, we've got a dozen or so coming in. Uh, welcome to ask questions and particularly either of Nick, but also of Alex as well. Uh, as we walk through uh, the discussion and, and how this panel is structured, uh, you have the opportunity, obviously something might uh, trigger, but also welcome to ask questions early uh, as we go through and I'll moderate that as best we can. Now, uh, I won't go too much into Alex's detail. I think he'll draw out of that uh, in terms of his own presentation. But uh, with Nick, maybe Nick, this is sort of, uh, sort of come through with what your observations were in the threat landscape. And again, we've covered this a lot on our work as well with uh, transformation. Digital transformation is often a common term you might hear. Um, so maybe introduce us to the, the, your threat landscape and the observations, uh, and uh, also sort of the relationship that you've established with flybys, and then that'll drive us into uh, Alex and those key considerations that he's observing. We're going to look at the top three first up, but uh, Nick, maybe your uh, initial observations. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I guess, uh, you know, digital transformation is a bit of a buzzword, right? And it, buzzwords are an occupational ha hazard in our industry. Um, you can't say a sentence without running into uh, a bunch of buzzwords. But really, digital transformation and network transformation now have been a really big part of any sort of technology operation. And, you know, I've said for a long time, every business now is a technology business. We, we, we realized that uh, a while ago, but it really didn't feel manifest until the start of the pandemic last year when we sent everybody home uh, to work from home and realized that our systems and networks really weren't set up for that. And we've seen a mad scramble for people to reorganize their businesses around that digital experience. And not, you know, not the e-experience, which is taking regular processes and making them online, but really taking that whole digital experience end to end. Now, while, while organizations have gone through that change, we're seeing significant um, changes to the, to, sorry, I shouldn't say, we've seen significant exploitation of that change by malicious actors and also by uh, invert, uh, inadvertently by employees who have struggled with that change, right? Um, putting organizations at risk. So from a, a threat perspective, as organizations move, send employees home and transform their networks and transform their operations and, you know, moving into cloud and re-architecting their apps, there's been significant amount of new threat surface that a lot of their existing tools haven't really mapped well towards because they, they, they all assume these concepts of sort of workplace and infrastructure security. I had perimeters around my building, around my networks, around my apps, and all of that sort of collapsed as we sent people home and moved workloads into the cloud and rebuilt our applications. Uh, you know, empowered developers, the rise of DevOps has challenged the, the old security model. So there's a lot happening in the space. Um, and it's very difficult, I think, for uh, 
particularly organizations have had an established uh, cybersecurity practice to keep pace with the change uh, because old habits die hard, as they say. Um, uh, and the, the, there's also investment in existing infrastructure and, and adapting to that. So we've seen big data breaches. We've seen organizations lose data uh, to malicious actors. But they're, they're, those organizations that and that data being held to ransom. And, and on the other side, we've seen inadvertent loss by employees who really aren't sure of what they are doing at home or feel more comfortable in violating policy controls in what, what we like to call tiny crimes here at Force Point, right? When you're at home, there's no one watching you over the, over the shoulder. You're not, you're, you know, your peers aren't around, the boss isn't around. So you're more willing to take shortcuts and, and do things. Also, it changes mentally the look at the way people believe their data is theirs, right? Um, one of the big problems companies have is that, you know, you create something at work and you think it belongs to you and not to the company. And there's a sense of entitlement there. I think that in sense of entitlement becomes even stronger when you've developed it, you know, in your bedroom at home or in the, in the home office. So all of these things have dramatically changed the threat landscape that organizations face and the way that we adapt to them. Um, and I, I've probably done enough talking because that was a very very that's long <laughs> introduction chris well that, um, that's that's fine nick and i think one of the things that i think even from that's why we turn to a CISO as well someone with a real job alex that uh, as as nick sort of describes that landscape and the environment that you've worked in uh that's the challenges that you're up against and you've been in the role for about 18 months and it's also that wave that we've seen over the last 18 months as nick's described uh, we wanted to kick off with your, your key observations and, and key considerations that you had and maybe start off with your role in flybys because I think something we uh, we highlighted is flybys is a, is a unique business in its own right uh, as well and that might uh, guide your your discussion as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So look, by, by way of my own background, you know, I'm the, the head of security at flybys um, and then that's a role that I've held, you know, since January 2020. Um, I joined flybys at an interesting Time in its history. So it was just post separation from Coles, at least the business, not the technology, um, and as its first permanent employee in security. And, uh, and my goal really was, you know, to, to define and build the function and the team. Um, and then personally for myself, you know, after a career spent, spent in, you know, established security functions, it was an exciting opportunity to do something green fields. Um, now, understanding flybys, I think, means understanding the context that we operate in. So flybys is, you know, we like to refer to ourselves as Australia's um, you know, most popular loyalty program, um, you know, I mean, in our audience, I think anyone who's a Coles shopper has probably seen, you know, flyby sort of plastered every time they hit the checkout. Um, but in terms of scale, you know, our, our members make up two thirds of Australian households. Um, you know, we send out over 1 billion emails annually um, and maintain world-class engagement rates. Um, and, and part of flyby's history is, you know, the, the change in the journey that it's been through, you know, the business was originally established in 1994, um, you know, was wholly owned by Coles between 2011 and 2018, and then became a joint venture in 2018. Um, so we like to think ourselves, you know, at times as, as Australia's oldest startup. So coming out of um, out of Coles meant, you know, we, we effectively had the opportunity to set up a whole new technology stack um, so that Flybys could stand alone as its own business. Um, and this is really what presented, you know, some great opportunities in terms of security. So, you know, the opportunities really were to, you know, to, to blaze a trail with modern security approaches as opposed to maintaining our legacy. Um, and part of that involved a whole, you know, replatforming of the business, you know, with the approach that we took rather than a lift and shift was a transform and shift. So, you know, Colt Flybys came out of an environment where it was, you know, traditional, you know, we kind of think of it as castle and moat approach to security and directly into a wholly cloud, um, you know, a cloud only approach to the extent that we don't have any, any definition of an internal network. Um, internally, of course, you know, we, we came up with an original name. We referred to it as Flybys 2.0. Um, so I might refer to that <laughs> from time to time. Um, and, and in a security sense, you know, we, we, we can think of it as a security transformation. I also like to think of it as a complete reimagining of security for the business. Um, and, and I guess talking to that, you know, the first thing to consider is, is the data itself. So we are a data business, um, you know, say that data is our lifeblood you know, it's 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 effectively what we're trading in um but it's also very very sensitive you know, it's sensitive to our members and it's sensitive to our partners 
Um, you know, we also recognise the fact that in dealing with our members and our partners, we're actually trading on trust. And that's a really fragile position to find ourselves in because trust is easily lost and you know, quite difficult to earn. So we had to consider making sure that, you know, that the data was sacrosanct and protected at all points um, in our transformation journey. Um, and that effectively led to the philosophy that was taken when we went through our transformation. And, you know, I like to refer to it as a data out philosophy that we effectively started with the data considerations around the data and then worked out from there. Um, and then that effectively led itself to, you know, as part of this conversation, what I think of as, as the top three challenges that we worked our way through. Um, you know, the first one is, you know, how do we build a sustainable function in terms of security? Um, you know, the second challenge being, you know, how do we support business objectives and speed to market? Because as a startup style business, we effectively can't get in the way of the business. Um, and then we've got that challenge because we have very, very mature businesses as our owners. You know, how do we build the maturity of an established enterprise um, you know, into a business that operates as a startup without affecting and impacting those first two challenges around sustainability and speed and agility. Um, and, and then there's a few things that we really baked in to, to our thinking underneath those. You know, in terms of sustainability, it really boiled down to, you know, keeping things simple. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's easier said than done yeah. oftentimes. Um, and, and that led itself to both our operational model and the technologies that we chose. Um, you know, making an effort to standardize wherever possible, um, because we don't necessarily want bespoke and band-aid solutions everywhere. Um, avoiding reinventing. At the end of the day, if something is commodity, we should deal with the commodity service and leverage that as opposed to trying to blaze our own trail. Um, avoiding hype. So, you know, there is a lot of technology that comes with a lot of hype out there. But frankly, if it's, you know, not fit for purpose, you know, incorrectly implemented, it, it's not going to deliver value. Um, and then the final thing really was, you know, around the model that we built the team around, you know, that entails things like, you know, partnering for capabilities we can't deliver at scale, um, you know, or even for highly specialised or technical skills that we can't maintain on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, that, that second challenge around supporting business objectives, you know, there were, there were a few things that we did there to, to realise that. Um, you know, the first was to embed security within business processes. And, and it's funny coming out of, I guess, larger and more established organizations. Um, that's something that's very, very hard to do because we were there from the onset. We actually managed to achieve, you know, those, those gains, which is fantastic. Um, you know, even some of our technical controls, you know, we, we run a pure zero trust environment that actually leads to a better user experience. Our users wouldn't know that's what sits under the hood. All they would know is that things just work and their logins work everywhere. And many of them are in fact passwordless but it delivers a better experience and it improves our control set. Um, you know, this financial year, even, you know, we're going down the path of a, of a SOC 2 um, assurance, you know, and this is, you know, again, to, to assist business agility, that's where we can present security back as a differentiator, you know, and provide confidence to, to our existing partners as well as future partners. Um, you know, we take a partnering approach in how we work. So security's goal is not to say no, uh, we prefer answers along the lines of, you know, yes and or yes but. Um, and of course, keeping an eye on the horizon because, you know, the business is always looking at new initiatives, new opportunities, and we need to be there to help guide them insofar as, you know, what speed bumps they may hit along the road, but also positioning ourselves to, to effectively be there to support them when they do move into new territory. Um, and then that final, you know, challenge around maturity. You know, there were a few things that we focused on there. Um, the first was to define a vertical for GRC right from the onset, not to wait until we had other areas of security defined before bringing governance, risk and compliance to the fore, um, and even defining the frameworks, you know, that, that that GRC team sits on top of, you know, up front, um, you know, finding ways to embed processes, you know, within a business that's growing and forming is quite challenging. Um, hence, you really want to have those frameworks up front. Um, you know, we work with our parent organisations, so... If, for those who aren't aware, our, our parent organisations are Coles and West Farmers, um, and we really do work with them, you know, to, to effectively best align with both and are quite open with both of them that, you know, we won't be 100% in one camp or the other, but we actually need to be respectful to them both. Um, and also utilising an approach where we're actually considering regulatory concerns now. So we don't fall into a, regular, a regulated market segment, but we are looking at the examples of other regulation that's out there today. Um, with, with the mindset of being regulator ready for when it does eventually happen in the future. 
Okay, well, there's about a hundred questions <laughs> I've got. So I'm going to start with maybe the high level and Nick, jump in whenever you uh, feel yeah. the need. But I suppose, where did you start on, uh, in terms of the principles? Was it a, a zero trust uh, principle? Did you establish principles first? I mean, the question is, where did you start? Like, where did you, where did the uh, sort of pen get out and, and pen to paper, so to speak? Where do you start? Is it, is it basically the principles or the approach? Uh, did you flip it around in terms of even the customer experience potentially as well? Yep. Where did you actually start uh, so, with this? So, so it really started in two areas. Um, the, the first was a, a robust set of security principles, um, zero trust being one of those. Um, and, and effectively, the principles, you know, led ahead of a defined security policy. So, you know, the principles led itself to the second thing, which I consider as a co-starting point, and that was security architecture. And effectively, those two artifacts uh, led the transformation from a security perspective. You know, the architect of defining, you know, how security sits into the world, the types of controls that we expect to see, and the ways that other platforms should effectively fit with security. And then the principles are used as a way not just to guide thinking and guide, guide you know, design and solutioning, but they're also used as a way to break deadlocks. You know, yep. where, where there is a conflict, we can sit down and have a conversation around principles and then use that to guide us forwards. And that, um, that obviously helps with your, your potential regu uh, sort of regulatory approach, but also your partners. When you talk to, to the Coles and West Farmers, I take it they're working along the same lines, or at least they understand the principles, uh, whether they're uh -huh. applying it across their businesses. They're pretty big businesses in their own right uh, as well. But, and then that, that helps guide that architecture, which then helps potentially any touch points that you might have with them. Absolutely. The principles definitely help from that regard. I guess that that's sort of right back at the early days. T today, we've moved a fair way from that. So now we do have, you know, a set of standards in place, policy in place, um, as well as a rough alignment to a framework. I won't mention which one, but many people are using it. Um, and then that allows us to effectively have those conversations. I say rough alignment because um, each organization, I guess, has their own variation on the frameworks that they're using. So we've tried to, again, come, come up with a way that allows the Flywise framework and the way that we approach security to be translatable between both Coles and West Farmers. Yeah. And head of security, where do you, where's the, uh, what, what's the structure there? Uh, CISO, you've got CISO in brackets, but you're head of yep. security. What's the sort of structure there at the ELT uh, level? Yep. So, so the ELT level is effectively, we've got our CEO, of course, um, our CTO, and then I report directly into the CTO. Got it. So security is, you know, considered a, a um, you know, I guess a subset of technology. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, it's, you know, I've, I've been a part of many businesses where even reporting into someone, you might not talk to your, you know, your, your direct manager's <laughs> peers. Um, that's not the case at Flybys. We, we still have a seat at the table um, and are often involved, you know, in the LT level conversations, um, particularly, of course, those relating to, to member data privacy or security. Yeah, and then and then your team. How did you have to build your team? You came in uh, yep. fresh, and, um, and 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 maybe one step back is: did you come in for this transformation project, or was it a replacement role? And then maybe yeah, no, the team I, around that. I, I can shed some light on that. Um, so effectively, coming out of Coles, um, Flybys had a trusted partner who was, you know, this, the, effectively here for the initial uh, setup when it comes from comes to security, sorry, stumbling over my words. Um, and, and effectively, you know, that individual was to, you know, to guide things, um, you know, from the platform perspective, you know, where nothing had actually transitioned from Coles yet. Um, so then prior to that separation from a technology perspective, I was brought on um, and, you know, I was the first permanent employee in the security space, really to establish the permanent function, pick things up as we went through the, uh, the transformation um, and then to build out the team. And, and now we've got a team that's broken up across, uh, you could say, four um, disciplines, even though one of them is, two of them are collapsed into one. And that's sort of a security team focused on delivery, which is made up of architects and engineers, um, a operations team, of course, and then sort of one team that's looking after GRC as well as culture. Right. Okay. And they've been built so you built that over the over the time right and you i take it you would have started with the delivery team 
first? Although no, you said you came no. in the GRC first. No, as well, no, right? actually, actually, it was it was um it was the other way around. We started with the operations team first. Okay. Just because we realised that we we had to have you know some boots on the ground there. It was impossible to to bring all the technology across, separate from coals, and not have those eyes on glass. Um, as well as you know, I guess that forward thinking partnering that we do within our operations team. Um, and then the delivery in the GRC teams were very, very fast followers soon after that. Um, but GRC was considered from the onset. So before those teams were brought in, um, I actually injected myself um, as well as my, my head of operations, um, who's sort of my 2IC, um, in, into those conversations in the shortfall. And, and what standards are you following uh, you, with your GRC? Is it a 27,001 or any others as well? Maybe cloud-based standards that you really go to and go, no, nah, that's... That's our benchmark. Yeah. From the standards perspective, we haven't actually gone with a single framework. So most of what we're doing from, from framework perspective is, you know, NIST CSF aligned. Okay. Um, but in the GRC space, we've actually taken, I guess, a bit of a, a novel approach, which is not to align to one specific standard, but instead we're trying to, I guess, identify hotspots build out there first. Um, simply because we've, you know, we've got the challenge, we've got a business that's moving at pace. Um, a large program of work dropping a whole set of standards in is sort of something we're trying not to do. Um, and we've actually adopted a number of standards, again, from our parent organisations and are reverse engineering those to fit into the flybys context. Yeah. Um, Nick? Yeah, anything? well, because <laughs> I'll just keep going. There, <laughs> well, uh, I think for me, when your the most interesting part was at the very start yep. where you said you re it was a security reimagining as opposed to a lift and shift and that to me is probably the most important thing here because everything else flows out of the reimagining um you said that you put data at the center of it as opposed to putting you know infrastructure or systems i was really pleased to hear you say data and not systems being the center of the focus right because if we were rebuilding cybersecurity today this is the way we would do it we would build it around data and users we wouldn't build it around the infrastructure which is is becoming increasingly abstracted away from us and can so rapidly change uh, and i think that that set you up i think if you didn't do that at the start this project for you would have been a lot a lot different in the um uh, a lot different, you know, 12 months in. Um, so that I, I think was the most important thing for me to hear from you is that it was the data uh, centric approach, that philosophy that that was the most important because that naturally leads you to the zero trust model because yeah. it's it puts the boundaries around the data and the user instead of the infrastructure. It naturally leads you down that path. I think that was probably the most um, salient point out of uh, out of all of that because if you didn't do that, it would have been. I, I reckon that you would have been very. It would have been very troublesome, uh, particularly when you get to that um, that uh, that maturity as you go along, when you've got these parent organisations, but you're looking at you know your whole supply. It's essentially supply chain security at that point because you're trying to deal with these upstream consumers of your data and then there is downstream consumers of your data and if you didn't take that data approach um it would it would have been some uh, uh, it would have been quite interesting i want to i want to double double click on something and, and again sorry for the buzzwords uh it, 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 it's got me interested when you said you wanted to avoid the hype yep. now cyber security I, i've been in this business 22 years we are essentially an industry of hype and buzzwords, as I said. I want to know what you think is the hype that should have been avoided and that you, that you avoided, because this is something that is very close to me because I have very philosophical discussions with my own colleagues within Forcepoint, but with other organizations as in what to buy into, into and what not to buy into. Because we're trying to look, you know, when you're trying to look over the horizon, the hype forms part of that journey yes. because there is there is the hype cycle, and eventually, what what is hyped today becomes tomorrow's regular uh, tool uh, and regular model. So I want to understand a little bit ab about that uh, 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 a little more, and then I've got one more thing I wanted to raise as a result of your opening remarks. Uh, 
Absolutely, absolutely. Look, the, the hype is, I'm not going to name one specific technology or, or one specific platform. It, it's probably more of a, an, an approach or an ethos that, that mm. we've taken. And that boils down to, you know, my own lived experiences, being part of organisations which have perhaps taken the brochure, looked at a few demonstrations and then bought into a solution only to discover that it either doesn't implement well, doesn't play within their own environment, um, or perhaps doesn't deliver the right results. So we've really taken the approach of everything needs to be tested, validated, proven before it is you know, viable and brought into our environment. Mm -hmm. And that will mean that if we're going to go down the path of selecting a, a technology, we will pocket and pocket quite aggressively. We'll probably look for a way to run it live in the environment for a period of time. Um, and effectively you know, make that upfront investment in people, in time, you know, and, and, and effectively perhaps even paying the vendor if we need to, to get the solution into a position where we can say hand on heart, this is the right way to go. Yeah. Um, it's probably also led itself, I guess, you know, in, in avoiding hype to avoiding aggressively narrow point solutions that only deal with one issue. And perhaps looking towards, you know, where we can either find a suite of solutions, um, you know, or partnering with organisations that can effectively do multiple things in, you know, one one platform and particularly where it's integrated. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you know, having, having run teams and being party to businesses where, you know, you're playing whack-a-mole across dozens and dozens of different consoles, we wanted to avoid that kind of an outcome um, for our own security business. Yeah, I, look, I think that's a really good point. Um, it's something I talk a lot about and it's definitely what I hear from a lot of organizations, the, the big drivers. I mean, you're, you're fairly lucky in that essentially you took a green a green fields approach post-migration, right? You, yep. So you had a lot of freedom there. But in an organization with an established infrastructure to try and do this, I mean, so organizations have got 70 and 80 security tools, um, you know, with probably half as many consoles managing them right and if that's if, if you're lucky so it, it's a it, it's a challenge and it, it br brings up two things that i think are really relevant the first thing that i got you went back to um you know your your uh, one of the first things that you went you, you mentioned was about partnering right making sure you had the right partners and skills and whatnot i, I call this smart partnering because you're you're really partnering for scale and skill Yes, uh, it, because I don't know about you, uh, but hiring right now is next to impossible. Trying to get candidates, be, uh, I, I, I gave a talk at Oscar about four years ago talking about the skill shortage in cybersecurity and nothing has changed in four years. Uh, I think we're still suffering from that skill shortage right now. So bringing people on board, so partnering for skill and scale, I, I think is, is, is really critical. And that um, I, I want to ask your. I want to ask you something. Sorry, Chris, if this is no, no. derailed some of what we were <laughs> talking about earlier. But you mentioned, you know, going for suites of products. Yep. And I think that is also related to the skills because there are only there. I, I think there's a finite capacity for people to be doing so many different things. So you need to concentrate some of the skills into particular tool sets. So, uh, so they're not, you know, swivel chair security analysts looking at different, uh, different consoles. I'm, a, I, I'm actually kind of in the thinking right now that we are, you know, you, you said you want to avoid point solutions. So you want to do more than one thing. But I, I think that we've ended up in a point where a lot of organizations have tried that. Um, they're moving away to suites, but they're collecting suites or platforms in the same way that they were collecting point products because they want a feature from one platform and then they want a feature from another platform. And instead of going, you know, these are two point products, they're now collecting two platforms. I want to yep. know if you've seen any of that inside, you know, your rollout and if this has caused any, um, uh, you know, uh, the, let's say heated discussion amongst <laughs> the people who use them, because we all know that security analysts all have their favorite tools yep. and uh, they often think that the guy um, or the other person who is running the other tool um, is uh, is crazy for using that tool. It uh, takes me back to my Unix days of, you know, Vi versus Emacs um, uh, sometimes. Absolutely. And and look, I've, I will make every effort I can to make, make my, um, my comments and my notes, you know, vendor and product agnostic. <laughs> yeah. um, 
but it's probably hard to avoid at least one mention in, in answering this. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, you know, we, we have taken the approach of trying to stick primarily with with suites of platform, of suites, suites of security technology. Um, the biggest part of that, and it's funny because it really answers to our back end, um, you know, or back office, should I say, not necessarily to our core platforms, um, was actually keeping most things within, you know, Microsoft's, you know, 365 world um, and investing in E5 licensing from the very, very onset. Um, that was one thing I think that, you know, we were quite fortunate to, to, to win that argument up front, as opposed to having a, I guess, a, a lower tier of licensing with less security capability built in. Um, what that's allowed us to do is, you know, when I say suites, there are, you know, I guess two separate suites. Um, there's the world that is entailed there for most, you know, back office type of activities. Everything else, however, um, so, you know, to be transparent with the audience, we, our run our, we run our platform out of AWS. Everything else is really, I guess, focused around that AWS world. Mm -hmm. And that is where we have had a bit of creep in multiple consoles. I wouldn't, you know, recommend to anyone running visibility, you know, of their AWS environment out of, you know, their, their 365 environment. Um, it just doesn't work. It doesn't so, work. No, no. It doesn't work. So, so that is where we have had to delve into, you know, for, for things like Seam and visibility, um, even for things like vendor, uh, like um, vulnerability management. Um, you know, there's great vulnerability management built into both, you know, the Azure and the AWS worlds. Um, if you want to be able to give your team a single pane of glass, you're going to need a third solution which bridges across the both of them. Yeah. So there have been, a, I guess, a number of those environments where we've effectively had to say, okay, we've, we've got effectively two clouds, um, but we want one solution that sits across both clouds. And we've had to find vendors that sort of sit between the two of them. Um, but for the most part, you know, other than our core platforms, we, we've effectively stuck with the, you know, with the, 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 the all in on Microsoft. But it's hard to do because their products, you know, I would argue they're not the, you know, the, the bleeding edge when it comes to any type of security capability. It's more of a, it's in one place. So architecturally, you have to keep things there if you're going to use that platform. Yeah. I think it's it's a little easier to do on the threat protection with that. Um, on the data protection, I think really it does require that, um, on the data protection, it really does require that overarching view because the environments, the end, the, the data environment is increasingly coming into two places. So the network is becoming less and less relevant, right? You know, you said you don't have the concept of an internal network. Yep. So the data exists in the cloud or on the user's endpoint, right? And um, you need to have the visibility in the endpoint. This is, be, this is very heterogeneous on this side. And the cloud, really, there's only three environments where that exists in. It's either in a hyperscaler like a AWS or in a software as a service that you're consuming, which is probably running on a hyperscaler anyway, um, uh, somewhere. So, you know, um, and the, then the, the sort of the, the private cloud. Um, so that the, the cloud side is a little bit more constrained when you start to look at those data things, but the heterogeneity in the, in the endpoint and the diversity there and the, the different ways Ways that users use that data uh, that becomes increasingly challenging when you are when you try to I, I i think we're at the point where you know the transition we went from on-prem into cloud and the tools from on in on-prem didn't translate well into cloud now we've got these suites in the cloud and the tools now aren't from the cloud aren't really you're trying to you're trying to make I've, I've got this so i'm going to try and make it work everywhere when in fact it might not do that. So you have to diversify. I actually don't think that we can get down from a security perspective down to single consoles. It's about consolidating. Yep. Uh, what I've seen and we've done, uh, I've, I've just been doing some work in, in, uh, with some large financial institutions outside of Australia in the region. And we realistically think instead of looking at 14 different vendors, they can get down to seven or eight. And even that is massive from a security perspective, because not just from the, the cost, but the operational side is yep. significant. I think chasing the perfection, or, you know, one or two, I, I don't know how realistic it is in, in today's world. No, and, and I don't think one or two works either. Um, yeah. You know, to, to, again, with, without naming vendors, we're effectively down to about six. Yeah. Um, and, and we keep it there. 
Um, and, you know, the, the, the reality is, you know, if we are going to look at a, an alternative vendor at some point in time, we will still try and keep it to that number and effectively look no, at a transition plan sound. as opposed yeah. to the creep. <laughs> yeah. But six is pretty good. Uh, I was going to ask around the AWS and, and Azure, but is there any, any particular leaning towards AWS for a reason? Uh, rather, because you obviously in the 365 might have been an a, a easy one to go to Azure. Yeah, look, that's probably a, a, a like I said, decision that was led outside of the security space, and and that really boiled down to the the partner that we we're working with. Um, you know, built in AWS, they were quite well versed in you know building their automations um, and other platform capabilities within AWS. Um, so that really led itself to that outcome. And again, this is a good example of you know security taking a yes and or yes but approach um you know if the business wants to move into you know whichever cloud fits their purposes that's actually a business decision what we'll yeah. do is you know meet them help to design the guardrails you know allow them to understand what risk they might be buying into and then support them to do that safely well one of the other questions i had around that is maybe we'll touch on skills you mentioned the structure of your team yeah. any impact on skills in that regard as well and limiting yourself to sort of six vendor partners does that potentially limit your skill set as well or just make it easier for your hires it's it probably makes it easier for hires um when it comes to dealing with our, our cloud environment so it, it really depends on which role it is so when i've looked at um you know roles for example in the operations space yes we would look for you know the right kind of skill sets you know around key technologies that being said, my hiring philosophy is a, is a little bit odd, I guess. I, I tend to hire for, you know, cultural fit first because I really look for people that will actually build the business, um, ability to learn second, and existing knowledge is third. If I find someone who is absolutely amazing in, you know, points one and two, then we will train them and support them to actually get up to speed on the technology because I'd rather grow the right kind of individuals in the team and have a high-performing team as, as, that, you know, as, as sort of that outcome. Um, when I flip over to the delivery side, that sort of, I guess, led to two different speeds, you know, when filling the architecture roles, those broad sweeping skill sets that could be applied between different environments were really the goal, not necessarily looking for people who could, you know, delve into the nitty gritty. Um, however, when hiring for engineering skill set, the opposite was true. We would look for people that had, you know, experiences, you know, within the certain clouds that we're operating within, um, you know, didn't even have to necessarily be detailed experience insofar as running it for a business but if they could demonstrate enough you know personal knowledge that they gained through their own experience through the interview process that would weigh in their favor as well and how uh, i don't we don't have the numbers what what size is your team are you uh i take it if you're focusing on culture i may <laughs> imagine you've got a relatively low or steady uh turnover rate too has the Maybe back to what Nick uh, mentioned in terms of that uh, skills shortage and not much has changed and anyone looking at security jobs, there's heaps, right? So take your piece. Call me, I'm hiring, please. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, maybe maybe around that because I think definitely uh, and part, part of a transformation project is you've got both the, the up sort of upstream as, as you come on, on board with the transformation project and then once you implemented it, does that impact on your team structure as well? Yep. So yeah, maybe just take it, just uh, we'll touch on a, on your hiring process maybe and, and your turnover rate and how that, how that seems to look for you. Absolutely. So almost all of our hiring was done um, effectively from the start of the first lockdown onwards. Right. So, you know, when, when we think of Melbourne's, you know, long, long lockdown, the original one in 2020, that was our hiring period. Uh, and we built the entire team through that, through that. So I was fortunate enough to, to meet, um, you know, one of my staff face to face before that ended. Um, and then everyone else was a 100% virtual hire. Um, and we've effectively built a team of eight and, you know, we've only had one individual turnover in that time frame. Wow. So we've, we've been quite good as far as the stability of the team and, and a lot of that really, you know, the, the, the culture focus is out to the rest of the business. Um, but internally, we really do make an effort, you know, to, to look after our teams, you know, to understand, you know, what their concerns are, you know, even, even things as simple as making sure we're having 
health check-ins on a regular basis, you know, as we go through, you know, second lockdown, third lockdown, fourth lockdown and, and into the future. Um, because what we've effectively lost is, you know, th those kind of interactions you would have where you take everyone out for a coffee, we yeah. go to lunch together or stay back for beers. Um, we've had to find ways of replacing that. So we, we think that that's been, a, I guess, a bit of a win culturally. Um, as for hiring, I mean, it's a it's a nightmare at the moment. You know, the, the, the there was already a skills shortage to begin with, hence the preference towards growing skills as opposed to finding someone who's exactly that skill set in market. Um, but the the lockdowns, you know, and, and the COVID restrictions and the reduction of people coming in and out of country yeah. um, has definitely made that more challenging. And I take it you're quite, I hate the word, but sovereign in your approach as well. So you can't necessarily go offshore, even though, uh, you yep. know, likewise. So you, you want to know who those staff are and, and quite, uh, yeah, in terms of on, on country, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The so we, we do have you know some strict rules around flybys data must stay within country. Yeah. Um, that does lead itself to hiring practices sort of along those lines as well. Um, that being said, though, I think one of the the great benefits there, I call it that, out of the the lockdowns, you know, was this realization that you know yes, we've already had the technology to work anywhere, but actually now our people are working anywhere. Yeah. So do we have to stay to, to one capital city when it comes to hiring? Um, so for example, one of my team members is a Sydney based person because they were simply the right person for the role. And I would extend that to any future hiring, you know, even in a future where we're no longer locked down, if the right person is in a different capital city, then why should that limit them from an opportunity? Or even in regional areas. I think Absolutely. this, uh, you know, when I, when I think about this uh, and you know, when, when we've, when I, when I've been on this sort of hiring um, activity. Uh, the big thing is you're trying to service a whole region yep. and time zone is more important than location, hmm. right? So it doesn't matter on, if I'm servicing customers in the East coast of Australia, as long as the people are anywhere along here, it doesn't matter anymore. You Absolutely. can, uh, you can, and, and, and I think the, the organizations on the other side are a lot more forgiving. They don't need to see you every week. Or every, you know, the once a month in person, uh, I, 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 you know, some of those things that you mentioned, Alex, that like you know, catch up, coffee, post work, uh, socialising, etc. Those are missing. Yes, and we have to have creative ways of dealing with it. Uh, but uh, I don't think that it'll go back to the way it was before. What we've transformed, and the transformation is going to be permanent. The the changes will be on the periphery of that, I think, um, you know, I had a question recently, Will, uh, from somebody who, uh, you know, would they get rid of all of the, their new infrastructure they've rolled out, all the new cloud-based infrastructure? <laughs> no way. No way, right? No. You've done the, you've transformed, you're not gonna go back. You're not gonna go back. If it changes, it's gonna change again. The, uh, but not backwards, it'll, it'll, it'll progress further. Well, I had a right? question on that, Nick, given the type of business flybys is, uh, as Nick's pointing out, is, is it uh, changing the structure of the business, culture of the business, um, how you do see yourselves moving forward? And then how much did security have to adapt or change or was it all ready to go because you had that architecture and uh, principles right? So we were in an incredibly healthy position when it came to the transition to, to remote work. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you it's not even in my notes or anything but the um you know the, the transition to remote work so we effectively ran a series of workshops um as we could see you know the, the writing on the wall and when it comes to COVID um you know met with the executive leadership team to effectively you know highlight the fact look we've got an issue here um we should enact our office unavailable um you know effectively con concerns within within our DR strategy um we had an all hands meeting with our CEO on a Thursday night and he effectively told the entire business, take your laptops home and work remotely until further notice. This was back in March, 2020 yeah. and we've been remote ever since. So from a technology perspective, I think it was a real, um, you know, the, the fact that we could transition overnight, it was a, you know, I, I guess a, a, a real tip to, you know, yes, we're on the right path when it came to our zero trust approach and the way that we'd architect the business. Um, you know, even when we look at our head office, so we transitioned offices during the lockdown. Um, 
we never had an office in our, you know, our, our future office and what we have now was never designed to be able to hold all staff members anyway. So yeah. flybys as a business was adopting a completely flexible approach. I think what it's allowed us to do is continue to grow the business without any concern that the office will need to be replaced because actually more and more people are choosing to work flexibly. Um, you know, the office has really become more of a colo space where people that need to collaborate turn up. Otherwise, most of our teams will, you know, will work remotely or choose to, um, you know, provided that that works for their circumstances. And I imagine that underlines the transformation project from a security perspective as well, because that's one of those key considerations, is it not? It's part of your business continuity and your disaster recovery is you're not just there protecting the data, but you're also protecting the business yep. uh, should circumstances change like what we saw last year. So I think it underlines uh, the approach that you obviously had if you're already ready for that. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and the fact that we had you know, effectively every single laptop for every single staff member, yeah. you know, was was built from the get go to operate on a hostile network. It was fantastic because we could effectively send people out and they're ready to work. Um, you know, sort of circling back to to one of the comments that, that Nick made around the the data protections and the data controls. You know, that I guess you know was the the thing that really allowed us to move. You know, the fact that the data is sort of sitting in its own you know safe island. Let's just call it. Um, and, and you're actually right, Nick. It is a it is a PaaS that's actually sitting on AWS as well. It's a, it's a dedicated platform, um, you know, which which has all the right controls built into it. But it really did allow us to to effectively divorce that concern. You know, that we weren't going to have people taking you know laptops filled with you know member PI or anything that's concerning home with them as part of that transition out of the office. Okay. Well, look, we've got uh, we've got just under well just over ten minutes, so certainly an opportunity for any of the the audience if you've got a question. Uh, or a comment throw that in now because we're going to run out i think one thing i wanted to touch on was what we haven't touched on was budget and culture we touched a little bit on culture but um i think maybe uh, and then i also wanted to touch on the force point and flyby's relationship as well and how that has come about so obviously this is why uh this session is brought to uh with nick here um maybe let's start with that because we might end up uh, answering the same question there um Maybe the force point flybys relationship, Nick, um, what do you bring to the table for a business like flybys? Uh, and then potentially, because you're obviously one of the six, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, and then maybe we can close off on some uh, final <laughs> sort of budget takeaways and uh, <laughs> I'm only well, thinking well, budget as well. <laughs> I, I know what force point brings to the table and, uh, you know, we, we bring best in class cloud-based data protection. Um <laughs> Uh, unabated uh, and uh, uh, and uh, an excellent zero trust model for access for data and for all of these things but i might let alex talk a little <laughs> bit about what, what we're doing there because it's actually a very interesting story <laughs> because um, we're currently not supplying flybys no 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 oh. so so, I'm so glad I, I asked you then, Nick. Like, what do you bring to the table? <laughs> I was I was waiting for, for for Nick to answer that one head on, but he's thrown it to me instead. <laughs> so so no, look, um, it, it's actually the the relationship, um, you know, with 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 flybys and force points. I guess is is still in its early days. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, though, Nick and I actually have a you know I guess a trusted relationship um, among the two of us in in that. You know, I think that I'm one of the people that Nick speaks to, you know, in industry, we often catch up regularly um, to, to discuss matters. Um, and, and likewise, you know, Nick is someone who I reach out to as a, as a I guess, a, a trusted advisor, um, you know, when, when dealing with things as well. So it's a, it's a relationship, I think, that is born out of, you know, some, some trust, mutual respect, you know, knowing and working with each other. Um, but our businesses at this point in time um, aren't actually sort of, you know, do, <laughs> doing, doing anything on the same page. Well... <laughs> There was an assumption on my end uh, either way. So I think, again, it underlines that that trusted relationship there. I had a, I did have a question here, didn't I, with um, how you uh, engage with the wider uh, community. I mean, obviously, Nick, is uh, that's part of his role um, as a sort of strategic business. You're, you're constantly talking to clients, Nick, mm. and you get that sort of inside observations and then you can share that with your own network, uh, who I'm sure over the years come and go uh, as direct clients uh, on the Indeed. business as well, as per their requirements. 
So Chris, I, you know, I've been in the industry 22 years. Yeah. Um, I run the strategic business here at Force Point. Um, and a lot of my job is thinking about horizon one and horizon two, where our customers are going to be in 18 to 36 months, not where they are today. Cause that's today's today's problem, right? Where, where the, the, you know, if the house is burning, you're putting out the fire. Um, we're thinking about where we need to be in, in, in two years, three years time. So that feedback that I get from the people that I know and that I've met, whether or not they're current customers or uh, potential future customers, it's a very collegial environment because it allows us, it allows me to share information bi-directionally with people and obtain information from them, which then goes and informs the strategy that we have here at Force Point, which is where do we make our investments? Which, which technologies should we either buy or build? Which, which, should, which should be we abandon? Which markets are in structural decline? So I, I, I tell people here at Force Point, I have the great job. I get to <laughs> think about problems. I get to say things and then other people have to do it. <laughs> Nice. Um, Hence so why it, I sit here. That's why Alex is the only one with a real job. He actually yeah. has to do it. <laughs> so, so having feedback from Alex and from his peers and from others in the industry is really important for me. It also allows me to sound out those those ideas with uh, with, with those organisations. And everything that we've discussed today is absolutely relevant. I hear the similar sorts of considerations um, from all sorts of organizations who are struggling, you know, uh, today's, today's story with Alex is a good news story because they've gone through a transition yeah. and they went really well with it. But I can, I can, the number of organizations I've dealt with that have been successful like that have been on, I can count on one hand. Yep. The ones who have significant challenges who are struggling with budgets, with resource allocations, with failed projects, with tooling that doesn't fit right, that's a pile up to your eyeballs. Yeah. And that is a challenge because early de decisions made early on have massive flow on effects 12 months down the track. So if they've picked the wrong tool or the wrong approach, so, you know, Alex said, I, we, we started with data and worked backwards. I've seen organizations that have got much more resource than Alex, teams of 60 and 50 people with budgets who I dare say would be um, orders of magnitude greater, make fundamental mistakes because they go, oh, we need to fix our web platform. Your web platform is not relevant to the business 12, you know, when you started a year ago, mm. it, 12 months later, it's a completely different game that you're trying to play. Oh, we needed to fix our VPN or we needed to fix our, our scene. Yeah. The tools and things are important, but when you're taking that approach as opposed to the outcome, the business outcome, the business protection, uh, it, 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 it will set you up for failure 12 months down the track. Um, so that's a lot of what I'm, I, I see right now uh, and, and, and some of the challenges. So yeah, uh, it, it's been good that um, Alex has had a really good experience and he's shared that with us. It's, a, it's an important point, I think, uh, yeah. Nick, given the landscape, that we see and you know, often only hear the bad news. Yeah. Uh, it, one, it's very quite encouraging that there is good news out there. So Alex, I'm sure it looks good on a resume that you've actually gone through something like this uh, as well. Exactly. It's like, wow. Um, and again, in the circumstances that you went through, so it really is, uh, you know, that definitely kudos to Nick for raising that, that that, that is uh, a good news story. And Nick, you've kind of just answered a couple of the questions just came in in terms of, uh, sort of insights into pertaining to advanced risk management measures uh, and then resilience and alternate business continuity plans. I think you've got to focus on what you're protecting. Uh, and yeah. that is in, in Alex's point and flybys was the data. Yeah. Uh, whether it's physical, uh, then you look at, again, what you're protecting and then you start from that uh, and work out. You don't keep it simple as best you can uh, was another key takeaway. One thing we didn't discuss, we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, the language Alex, was, how was the language, did you need to adapt or change the language, the security language? Uh, and Nick also raised in terms of the hype terminology, those types of things. The industry can be, uh, is renowned for its uh, hype and terminology. And yep. one was zero trust versus verify first and, and those types. Maybe any observations or commentary you had on, the, on language uh, during the project? Yeah, so look, it's funny because 
with this audience, I'm, I'm using, I guess, the industry specific language. Um, I typically wouldn't, however, um, no. you know, unless I'm dealing with a technical SME, an architect, um, or another security professional, I would actually steer away from that. And instead of, you know, dealing with the terminology, dealing with the, the, the language or buzzwords, um, really keep things focused to, you know, to outcomes, um, to results and what we're going to achieve, you know? So for example, when reporting up to, you know, the executive leadership team or onwards to the board, the focus is really going to be on, you know, the results that we're achieving, you know, the status of our risks, um, focusing on, you know, the outcomes, you know, our job is to safeguard our members, partners, you know, the staff and the board. Um, so we simply need to tell them that we're doing that or not, and that we're taking yeah. the appropriate measures too. As for the, you know, the technical controls that sit underneath the hood, as long as it's all working, they don't necessarily, you know, yeah. need to know what, what buzzword we're, we're working with today. How, how are you, or how did you, two questions. One, how do you report risk to the board? What metrics may you look at? And then also the, during the transformation project from a project management plan, I imagine it wasn't just a Gantt chart uh, approach. No. Uh, yeah. How did you report and update that? So from, from the project management perspective, it was actually a lot easier. I kind of miss having that whole support <laughs> structure there because we would effectively be providing input to the overall PMO and then the PMO would run with that. Um, again, you know, the, the project was moving the entirety of flybys. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things that security could almost disappear as a line item. As, as long as our line item was green, uh, we were, we were nice. quite good to go. Um, when it comes to reporting risk to the board, though, you know, we, we effectively have our, you know, risks that have been identified at board. And then, you know, our primary reporting really is on the movement of that enterprise level risk. So, you know, we've got our own, you know, GRC process. Um, we've recently gone from spreadsheets, unfortunately, to an actual risk platform where we, you know, sort of me measure, quantify and track the status of our risks. And then, you know, we will update the, the enterprise risk, you know, with those movements accordingly. Nice. Yep. So, oh, by the way, Alex, don't, don't, don't knock spreadsheets. The world runs on spreadsheets. <laughs> Mate, whole businesses run on spreadsheets. Whole businesses <laughs> run on Excel. That's, uh, that, that's, uh, I think very, uh, it's They're hard to get away from. I'll give you that much. Get away from. <laughs> um, and I might, I might just make a, 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 a very quick comment there. Um, uh, uh, Chris around the sort of the language that you, you mentioned and, uh, Alex, you, you said that you, you avoid the technology terms when dealing with, with the board. This yeah, is the yeah. one piece of advice that I give every CISO. Um, I, we as technology people in the cybersecurity industry tend to think that we are the most important people in the business. Our tools and what we do are the most important things. The business doesn't really care though. The business cares about the outcome. Yeah. And that's the, that's the running of the business. They don't care about the widget. They don't care about the sassy. They don't care about the zero trust. They, want, uh, they don't care about any of those things. They care about the outcome. Is my data protected? Are my users protected? Are my customers protected? Is my business going to operate? Everything needs to be related back to those core business outcomes. And if you can do that as a CISO and articulate the risk to those outcomes, you will get funding, you will get support, and you will, you will be successful. And then from a vendor, and I, I tell this to all of the people who work for, for me and with me here at Forcepoint, if you can work with a customer, not to worry about what the widget's doing, but what's the outcome of the widget, what is the outcome the customer's trying to achieve? You will have better engagement with the customer because you're talking at them to, with them at a different level. Um, so that, that was my, that were my closing remarks around, around uh, uh, language and outcomes, I guess. Uh, I like it. And, and you've, you've kind of nailed it. The fact that uh, even, you, you, again, we go back to that relationship that you had uh, as long as you're providing value, that's where it counts. And maybe there's a there's a question here, and maybe we'll close this off uh, for you, Alex, as a closing uh, takeaway. What do you think is the immediate security challenge for Australian businesses, which has largely been overlooked or has been underplayed, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously in a security context? And we'll have that as our closing uh, comment. Do, do, do we have another 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> no. Just uh, try, maybe I'll even try. your top three. <laughs> no, look, I'll, I'll try and condense it down, right? So we've we've just come out of a period where everyone has been talking about the impact of COVID, COVID lockdowns. 
I actually think there's a lot more there and it's mm. not COVID specific. It's the cultural change that COVID has brought across. Agreed. People's expectations of how they work, where they work has fundamentally changed. And, you know, we, we'll never put the toothpaste back in the tube. That's actually what I think the, you know, the, the biggest risk that we need to keep an eye on the horizon is not just when it comes to our, um, you know, our own businesses and our own teams, but actually the greater world that we interact with, you know, our partners that we might've assumed were, you know, we're interacting with a, you know, secured, trusted environment, their staff may be scattered and they mm -hmm. may not have the same level of controls sure. in place. You know, with the way we assessed them as green 12 months ago, they may not be today. Um, so I really think it's that cultural change that's, you know, effectively occurred across the entire Australian landscape. That's going to be the thing that keeps coming back, you know, so, sort of like a, a reoccurring heartburn, yeah. um, you know, for the years to come. It's far from over, is it not? So... Uh, and Nick, maybe your thoughts on that, uh, maybe on the other side, anything being, oh, maybe that was the underplay, anything being overlooked? <laughs> well, look, I, I think uh, I overlooked and underplayed are very similar uh, here. Uh, I, I said before that change is going to continue to happen. It's changing not just on the, the, the core fundamental change to our businesses, but on the periphery of that. That cultural impact and this third-party supply chain risk, I think, is really, uh, really big. But the one that I think is being overlooked right now by a lot of organisations, particularly in the medium-sized enterprise in Australia, is the impending changes to regulation, yeah, I think what will happen is we're going to get into 2023 and then every consultant in the country is going to be busy talking about regulatory compliance <laughs> and personal responsibility for directors. Uh, and uh, I think that is going to be the big change. We've been talking about it for a couple of years. You know, I did an interview with, uh, uh, with the ASX um, a couple of years ago. I was on a panel for that and it was published great article came out the end the other side of it and nothing happened and i think we're now 2021 to 2022 as we get to 2022 it's going to be uh, something that's really been overlooked by medium enterprise i think the bigger businesses are really starting to to get involved in this um but the old days of we're not a bank um, we're not regulated, don't cut it anymore in the data economy, especially when we are looking at regulating, I mean, the impact of critical industry, the Critical Industry Act and all of this, uh, you know, systems of national significance and all of this is... Um, but it's also the, uh, the user experience and the customer expectations as well. So if you... If you get breached, 100%. then uh, they come back and then there'll be a legal avenue that they can have. So... The landscape won't change. The landscape's only going to uh, continue as we have seen. Uh, but it's also, as you say, Nick, the, the, legatory, the regulatory and also that legal framework will be there. So look, on that note, we've just gone slightly over time. Thank you to uh, the, uh, the audience there. And also for those who made a comment and asked some questions at the end. Uh, and let me just quickly, just before we go, I'll just bring that up. So we've got something to look to. Um, Thank you very much to our panel, uh, Alex Lazar, the Head of Security CISO with Flybys. Thank you so much, Alex, and Nick Savides, the Senior Director of Strategic Business at Forcepoint. Thank you very much. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Alex. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, attendees. And thank you. And also thank you to Forcepoint. Uh, this was held in partnership with Forcepoint. So it's great to have Nick back on. Uh, and I might have to put some links in here. Uh, as well to our previous uh, articles and also to uh, his previous interviews. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to stop that there and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, gents. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.